Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in a couple of previous videos, I've looked at common source amplifiers with diode connected loads. And here I'm going to look at common source amplifiers with regular boring active loads. If you go to this FPAA virtual machine tool site by my colleague Jennifer Hassler and scroll down a little bit, there's a slide deck I've referred to a lot, slides on experimental setups. And if we look on the right here, there's a common source amplifier where the input goes into an NFET and there's a PFET that's basically set up as a current source. Here's some equations that are worked out under the assumption that the transistors are operating in the subthreshold regime, which is a little weird. This is a regime that most textbooks just call off. And to the extent that people talk about subthreshold at all, at least in digital systems, they usually refer to subthreshold conduction as a parasitic effect. But it really is a useful mode and the key to developing low power devices. So there's a formula that gives the output for a given input related to this K parameter and these sigma parameters. Now the sigma parameters are related to channel length modulation, also colloquially known as the early effect, although the term early effect technically only applies to BJTs. People still use it here because it's a similar effect. And in the case where you ignore the early effect, sigma is basically zero. So the gain is basically infinite and you would expect there to be a huge slope around some particular transition point. So I'm not particularly interested in exactly what this slope is, what the gain is. I'm really just interested in where that transition point is. So I asked the question, what value of the input would give me an output voltage that was half the power supply voltage? I thought that would be a reasonable thing to do. And if we plug in VDD over two for V out, and we also assume that the sigmas are zero, we get this nice formula of VDD minus VREF. Okay, enough math. Let me start up the RASP tools developed by Jennifer Hassler's research group. It's based on Scilab slash Xcos. Professor Hassler's group provides an Ubuntu image, but I prefer to run a special port I made for the Mac. After I refine this a little bit, I'll make this available on GitHub or something. Anyway, let me load up my common source amp that uses an NMOS as the main amplifier transistor and a PMOS transistor as the current source. Let's see, so I have kappa set to 0.7 for both transistors. Both have the same threshold current and they both have a threshold voltage of 300 millivolts. I have a one picofarad capacitor at the output just to make sure it simulates. And I'm going to set the voltage at the gate here to be two volts. The VDD is 2.5 volts. Oh, I hate the way this is constantly rotating these symbols. Put that back. Thank you, Scilab. Whoops, and my apologies. I just realized I was recording that segment using my laptop microphone instead of my nice microphone. All right, with that fixed, let's try simulating this and see what happens. All right, so we get a nice slope down here that's very, 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 very steep. And it happens at 0.5 volts, which is 2.5 minus two. So that makes a lot of sense. All right, let's see what happens if I do something completely ridiculous. Can I set this down to 0.5 volts or will it just really complain and freak out at me? Oh, why does it do this? Rotate, rotate, rotate. All right, so let's simulate this completely ridiculous case. It in fact simulates. All right, so 2.5 minus 0.5 is two. Now it has a much smaller range over which we get this nice, very steep slope, but it does seem to work. That's pretty wild. All right, so what if we put this at 1.25 volts? What if we set this right in the middle? Now I should mention here that we're definitely not in the sub-threshold case for this transistor up here at least. So one should probably rework that analysis for these various cases. If we put it at 1.25, oh, there we go. We get this nice slope here at 
1.25. We're definitely limited in terms of the extremes compared to putting the reference over here. We had a much bigger vertical range before things started to level out. So that's pretty interesting. Let's see, what happens if I change kappa around? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this kappa to, say, 0 0.3. And then I'm going to change the main amplifying transistor kappa to 1. Oh, it definitely moved things around. So remember, I didn't change this here. This was still at 1.25. But changing the cap is so drastically like that moved where this transition was. What if I flip that around? What if we make this cap a 1 and the kappa for the main amplifying transistor 0 0.3? Let's now see what that looks like. Oh, it looks like that. Okay, it does not like that. Well, I mean, the simulator is happy, but that would not be a useful situation. Okay, let me put these back at 0 0.7. Okay, let's rerun that case just to make sure we have what that graph looks like in our head. And we have this nice slope here at 1.25. All right, now the next game I want to play is to play around with the threshold values. I think a more realistic value for the threshold value for the PMOS transistor, I should say the threshold voltage, would be maybe 800 millivolts. Let's see what that does to our curve. Ah, and that shifts the curve to the left. All right, so suppose we had a situation where VT for our PMOS was 300 millivolts, but for the NMOS, it was 800 millivolts. This is just to see what happens. As we might expect, it shifts the curve to the right. All right. Okay, so I stopped the video for a bit to try another experiment. Here I set the PMOS transistor to 0.8, and here I set the NMOS transistor to 0.3 in terms of their threshold voltages. And here I set the reference voltage to 0.75, which is half a volt less than that 1.25 center point to try to compensate for the fact that the threshold voltages here now differ by 500 millivolts. All right, so if I do that, then it looks like, ah, then that puts it back into the center. So that's a trick that might be useful. Okay, so let's close that out and pull up the complementary case where we have a PMOS transistor being the primary amplifying transistor, and we have an NMOS transistor providing the active load. So let me double check here. Yep, all of my usual settings for both transistors are the same. And let's start with a reference voltage of 0.5 volts. All right, so with that reference of 0.5, we have a big steep slope here over here at two volts. And I'd expect that if I do something ridiculous like set this to two volts, we should get a slope that's over at 0.5 volts, but is not gonna have the same kind of range. And I was right about that. So we have the slope at around 0.5 volts. Oh, but notice it sort of uh, levels out here a lot sooner on each side. That's kind of interesting. And if I were to put this in the middle, let's see, so we're setting the gate voltage here to be half of VDD. We get this nice curve right here. So we have a steep slope here at 1.25 volts. And if you think about it, this is kind of half of an inverter because if I were to take my input here and then apply it to the gate, then I would get sort of a nice symmetric inverter curve. I might be stretching that analogy a, a little too much. Anyway, we could continue to play games with trying different parameters like changing the kappas and changing the thresholds, or you could even start playing around with the early effect, yada, yada, yada. But I think that's enough for now.